called socks and underwear. We've been talking about, you know, that gift that uh, is the one that you really didn't want, but it's the one you really need. That's the way socks and underwear tend to be. In fact, maybe you've seen one of those humorous uh, America's Funniest Video compilations of kids as they open gifts and you know, there's one uh, especially that I can remember and that's exactly what he's getting, socks and underwear, and you just can see the disappointment and you can hear his disappointment, the words. He got something he needed, but it wasn't something that he really wanted. And so we've been talking about that uh, all, all this Christmas time since Thanksgiving. And week number one, we talked about the unexpected gift because Jesus came and he came in such an unexpected way. Um, in fact, there were lots of people that, that missed it because it wasn't what they had anticipated. Week number two, we talked about gift return. Uh, and there were a lot of people that would just as soon return the gift that God had given through Jesus. In fact, lots of people rejected Jesus. They rejected him because he wasn't what they were looking for. They expected something else. They wanted something else. And so they rejected him because of that. There were other people that rejected him and still do because of the baggage that the people he's associated with have. And so we talked about the gift return. Last week, we talked about gift uh, received. And how do we receive this gift that God has given to us? And we concluded by saying it ought to be done with gratitude, received with gratitude because we didn't pay for it. And it ought to be received with humility because we can't afford it. And it ought to be received with joy because we don't deserve it. And so today, I'm going to talk about the best gift ever. You, you know what the best gift ever. You know what a great gift. You know what that entails. But before we talk about that, you also know mm, probably what a worst gift is. The worst gift ever. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, Jimmy Fallon uh, on The Tonight Show asked people to tweet in with the hashtag worst gift ever. And he uh, compiled some of those responses. Uh, if you don't watch it, I thought maybe I'd share some of those with you. Smitty Chick said this, my husband was given the book, The Ugly Little Boy by his grandparents when he was young. Yeah, that probably classifies as the worst gift ever. Maybe you've had something given to you like that. Kristen Rose 124 said, when I turned six, my parents forgot I asked them for a baby doll, so they told me it had been kidnapped and gave me a ransom note. So yeah, parents do all kinds of things when they forget, and so yeah, that constitutes a worst gift ever. Dag, dag, dag yo. One year, my mom gave us calendars that were only good for one more week. Her response was, no wonder they were so cheap. Yeah, worst gift ever. Or maybe this one right here, my grandma from Dill Darlene. My grandma once wrapped 20 pairs of socks, 24 pairs of socks individually. By the 20th pair, my little brother was in tears because nobody wants socks. Nobody wants underwear for Christmas. You've received probably one of those gifts, but you've probably received a great gift. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think for just a minute, and then I want you to share with the neighbor right there. In fact, I want you to do this at all of our campuses. I want you to think of a quality of a great gift. What is, what is a quality that you would think of a great gift? I want you right there, right now where you're at, both at our Sepulpa, Quita campuses right here. You guys share that right now. Just turn to your neighbor. What's one quality of a great gift? Go ahead and share those right now. Anybody else? Share them right there with your neighbor. Just turn and talk to somebody. You may not know them. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and say something. What's the quality of a great gift? So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today. In fact, I'm going to list off some qualities of a great gift and see if they reflect maybe some of the things that you have thought of. One of the things that makes a great gift is that time and thought went into that gift. Somebody thought about it. it. It wasn't haphazard. It wasn't random. It wasn't last minute. You know, it wasn't like they went down to my favorite Christmas shopping store, Dollar General, and just picked up something. It was something that had been thought through. Now, the value isn't necessarily in the price uh, that they paid, but some time, some thought had gone in to that gift. You knew it was heart felt. 
Our youngest daughter, Kimber, uh, back, back many years ago when she was little, she didn't have any money, and so she gave one of those time and thought gifts. She gave me a coupon book, and you know, on the first page it said something like, I'll give you a 10-minute back rub, and the next page was, I'll wash your truck, and the next page was, was something else. You know, she had all these, she'd given some thought into all of those kinds of things that, that uh, you know, maybe I might want. It was something that she'd given a lot, a lot of thought to, a lot of investment into, something that she had really thought through. And I thought about, you know, maybe a coupon book. And so for those of you that are, you know, like grown kids now, I thought maybe uh, something that you could give if, uh, you know, you wanted to give a coupon book. I would prefer things like page number one will pay this month's mortgage. That would be a great thing to add, something like that. Or uh, I'll mow the lawn all summer, you know, that would be a great gift. So if anybody's looking for coupon gift ideas, that would be some right there. Time and thought went into the gift. Secondly, the gift is personal. It, it, it's something that adds a personal touch. There's a connection there. The gift fits you. It is you. The giver understood your likes and your dislikes and your personality, the things that you might want, the things maybe that you've been desiring. It's something you've talked about. It's something you've mentioned. It's something that, that, you've, that, that they've overheard you saying uh, 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 something that you like. Uh, in fact, I, I have a terrible memory. I have to write those kinds of things down. And so I keep a running log in my, my smartphone and it's usually something just titled gift ideas and so I write down things when my wife mentions throughout the year you know something that she likes or something that she might want and occasionally I I get it just right and I get her something and she wanted it and then she's like well how did you know that I wanted this and People just say, well, you mentioned it way back in July when we were at some store and I just took note of it and I literally did take note of that. The gift is personal. Or number three, the gift reflects the relationship. There's something about it that, that enhances the relationship. There's something about the connection here. Maybe there's a deeper meaning behind the gift. Maybe it shares a story that only the two of you know. Maybe there's an inside joke that they unwrap it and only the two of you get. Maybe there's something that, that, uh, that involves a, a deeper, uh, the romantic part of the relationship. Maybe a husband and wife or a boyfriend and a girlfriend and there, there's something special about uh, that gift that reflects simply their relationship or their desire to pr pursue that relationship further. Or this one, number four, the gift requires a sacrifice. Uh, there was great sacrifice made for that gift, and it makes it special. There was a price to be paid for that gift. Maybe it was financial. Uh, apparently, if you uh, pay attention to television commercials right now, the, the big gift is uh, people giving cars. I, I don't know. Every television car commercial has somebody given a, a, a vehicle, a brand new vehicle to somebody. I don't know who all those people are, but I would assume that would be a great sacrifice for some people on a financial uh, uh, element. But that's not just financial. It can be a sacrifice of effort or sacrifice of time. It uh, is something that, that comes with a labor of love. Uh, so there's a sacrifice that's involved, a great gift as sacrifice. And then lastly, the name of the gift is fitting. Something about names. In fact, the, the name of a gift, uh, uh, sometimes the gift have impact because of the name that they have. You know, when I was growing up, you, the, us guys, we had G.I. Joes. Something about G.I. Joe. It would not have been the same had it been G.I. Ralph or G.I. Tom. It just doesn't have the same ring as G.I. Joe. Or can you imagine Rubik's Cube being named, I don't know, Bob's Contraction or, uh, you know, Jerry's Thingamajing. Uh, you know, it just doesn't have the same thing as Rubik's Cube. Or, or some of you, maybe this year, you know, if they're still selling them. You're wanting a hoverboard, but it's not. It wouldn't be near as as cool to have a floating skateboard. Hoverboard just has a ring to it. Or maybe if you're a Star Wars fan, uh, uh, you want a lightsaber, but a lightsaber just sounds so much better than glowing sword. There is something about 
the name. There is something that is critical about the name. Now, there have been lots of anticipated gifts through the years, some really popular gifts through the years. And, and uh, it seems like every year there's, there's like one or two big things that everybody's wanting, everybody's after one of those. And so here's the deal. I want you by show of hands, uh, if uh, you wanted one of these gifts, if you got one of these gifts, if you gave one of these gifts to somebody, okay? So let's do this again at all of our campuses. 2010, the big gift was Apple iPad. Put your hand up in the air if you gave one, got one, wanted one, you know, okay. Uh, 2005, Xbox 360. Anybody? Anybody get, get that? Xbox 360. Uh, year 2000, the Razor Scooter. Anybody? Anybody got, gave, received? 1996, I know we're going back away. Tickle Me Elmo. Come on, be honest. Tickle Me Elmo. Even worse than that, 1992, the Barney doll. Anybody brave enough to admit you gave or got one of those? A little better, 1989, Nintendo Game Boy. Anybody? Nintendo Game Boy. How about 1983, the Cabbage Patch doll? Put your hands up in the air. Going back to 1978, the big game of the year, big Christmas gift, Hungry Hungry Hippo. Anybody? Or, I wish I'd have been in Parrot 1975, the big gift was a pet rock. Pet rock. I mean, I, that, what a deal. That would have been an easy, uh, easy one to do then. 1973, electric football. You remember you plugged it in and the little guys just kind of vibrated around. I didn't get a brand new one, but I had a used one later on and we got it at a garage sale. Or 1965, Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Anybody? 1963, the Easy Bake oven. Been around for a long time. Not near as popular though as it used to be back in those days. A little light bulb that screws in there long before microwave ovens. Or how about 1952, Mr. Potato Head. Mr. Potato Head. You know, even the best gifts eventually run their course. And over the years, they're replaced by another great gift. Every year, something different comes out. And some of those great gifts that we talked about, you don't even own anymore. You don't know anything about them. They're in an attic. They wound up in a garage sale. Or likely, they're in a landfill somewhere. And, and they're rusting away. They're rotting away. Uh, we've forgotten all about them because some other great gift has come along. And you have to go back to the very first Christmas in order to find a gift that meets all the criteria of a great gift and yet will never be replaced, never be outdated, never be obsolete. The Bible tells us about it in Luke chapter 2. In fact, we know it as kind of commonly the Christmas story. And it's the shepherds who receive the first message. In fact, they're just minding their own business. They're out in the hills just doing their job, and angels suddenly show up to tell them about this great gift. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. That, that's a great thing for an angel to tell you if you're going to you know, just be all of a sudden surprised by them. I don't know that it worked, but anyway, angels typically said, don't be afraid. And then here's the message. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And we get proclamation of the greatest gift that has ever been given. It's prophecy that is, uh, it was fulfilling prophecy from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. So how does Jesus compare to our criteria that we laid out of great gifts? How does Jesus line up with those things that, that we talked about that would describe great gifts? Well, we talked about time and thought went into the gift. So did time and thought go into the gift of Jesus? The Bible tells us that before the foundations of the world were laid, that God planned for his son, Jesus Christ, to come into this world and to be the needed Savior. 
Man, I, Jesus doesn't just show up in Luke chapter 2. We don't read through the whole Bible and all of a sudden get to the New Testament and Jesus is there. We're told that in the beginning, Jesus was. He was with God. Jesus was God. Jesus has always been around. And, and the game plan throughout has been that Jesus would come and bring the people back to God. That is the, the gift. In fact, Genesis chapter 3 we begin to see already uh, the promise of Jesus. And then we begin to read prophecy after prophecy throughout Scripture. Uh, over 60 major prophecies, some 250 minor prophecies concerning his coming and his life, written hundreds of years before he was born. Specific things, not, not just general things, but specific things like he would be born of a, of, a, of a virgin. He would be born of the house of David. He would be born in Bethlehem. He would be presented with gifts. All of those things came true, and it shows the thought and it shows the planning it shows centuries and centuries of planning and working towards this incredible gift time and thought went into this gift well what about the second thing the gift is personal the gift of jesus is 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 personal jesus came to enter into a relationship with us he didn't come so that we could be a part of religion he didn't come so that you could just be a part of some church he came to be in relationship with you it's personal we're not talking about a god who's just out there we're talking about a God who wants to be with you. He wants to be personal with you. That's why the, the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Christ's birth, spoke of the coming of Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. It's, it's personal. But, but that, that wasn't enough for God. God wasn't content just to be with us. God said, I want, I want to go a step further. And he became one of us. John 1, 14 says the word, Jesus, became flesh and he dwelt among us. In fact, one version says he came to our neighborhood. Jesus incarnate. He came and became one of us. That's personal. You know, I was reading a, a, a news report just recently. The headline said, nuns pose as prostitutes to save sex slaves from brothels. So I began to, it, it captured my attention, and I began to read through the rest of the article. And evidently, there's a group of 1,100 religious Catholic sisters who currently work undercover in brothels in at least 80 different countries and their whole goal is helping to free victims of sex trafficking and slavery. And so they pose as prostitutes. Nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows why they're there, but they're there on a rescue mission. They are there to help save. L listen, they, those nuns went beyond just uh, uh, saying, we're going to give money and we're going to pray for. For them, this became something very personal for them. They showed up like Jesus did, became very personal. Now, just real quickly, we're talking about this being a personal gift, but sometimes we confuse that. We're not talking about this being an individual thing. Personal does not mean individual when it comes to accepting God's gift of Jesus. There is something very communal about that. That's the, the nature of the church is people together. And so while we're, we're told about this personal relationship with Jesus, it doesn't, there's not an individualistic thing that is meant by that. It means that God came to meet with us, to be with us, and to become one of us. Number three. Does the gift reflect the relationship? Does the gift of, of Jesus reflect the relationship? In fact, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, uh, the world, that me and you, you personally, for God so loved the world. I, I'm so glad that that word so is in there. I mean, it's one thing for us to understand that God loved the world. We would all expect that. We would expect nothing different than that. But I'm glad it says God so loved the world. Because you do things differently when you love like that, don't you? 
You do things like I did when my son Kyler was four and five and he pay, played coach pitch baseball. And, you know, you only got a hit about every 100 bats. It was the most boring thing. Every time some little distraction took place, all the kids were off and, you know, and, and nobody paid attention to the game. But all of us parents, we showed up at the game and we had matching shirts that matched the kids and matching hats that matched the kids. First National Bank had sponsored our kids and so all the hats and shirts said FNB on it, but we had to make that sound like, you know, something four and five year old little kids would want. So it was at First National Bank, it stood for fire and balls. And so we were the fire and balls team and I wore a bright red shirt and I wore a matching hat and I helped on the sideline and I helped the coach and we jumped up and down when, when the rare hit happened and when someone actually caught a ball. That is so loved. And the only way that we could truly know the love of God is that he wanted to be in relationship with us and he became one of us and so that's exactly what Jesus did so that we could have an ongoing relationship with God number four the gift requires a sacrifice I, I, there's no doubt that that is the case with Jesus in fact the sacrifice started long before the cross, isn't it? First John 4, 9 says, God showed us how much he loved us by sending his, only, his one and only son into the world. I mean, just that process right there is a sacrifice. We're talking about God, God above everything else, eternal God coming into the world and going from you know, infinite to now being finite, going from unlimited to restricted, going from from no containment to having to live in the womb and to go through the birth channel and to be born and to be a helpless little infant. I mean, we're talking about sacrifice going from glory to, to a manger, to a stable. God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. That is what Jesus came for. He is the ultimate sacrifice. Well, there's one other in our list, and that is the name. Is the name fitting? You know, there's a trend going on in names right now. We're just reading about as uh, parents are naming new little boys and new little girls. The trend is to name children after Instagram filters. I, I'm, I'm serious, really. Uh, if you don't know what Instagram is, it's a social media outlet, and uh, it specifically revolves around pictures. And so there are these filters in Instagram, and it can change the look of your uh, uh, picture. It can enhance it. It can create some special mood or look for that. And so there are names for these filters that you might choose. Some of the top picks for boys that come from Instagram filters are this, Lux, Ludwig, Amaro, Rees, Hudson, Kelvin. Those names are Instagram filters. For girls, Juno, Valencia, Willow, those are all popular choices. Mary and Joseph were told by God what they were to name their child. In fact, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is a fitting name. It's a powerful name. It's a name that means Savior. You know, there's one additional quality that we find in Jesus that goes beyond this criteria here, because each year... Those gifts that are popular, those gifts that are most anticipated are replaced by an entirely new line of gifts that seem to go beyond what was available before. The technology changes, the interest changes, our culture changes. And that's what makes Jesus the best gift ever. Jesus is a timeless gift. Jesus is God's eternal gift. And what he offers us is eternal as well. It's the best gift ever. 
Can, you, can I tell you just real quickly about a great gift that I received just recently? So it was August 1st of 2014 that Andrea and I received a phone call that said, could you watch a little girl who's in the foster child system? We just need you to watch her for just the weekend. It's Friday night and they're calling us and we can watch Friday, Saturday. We'll pick her up Sunday night. Andrea and I had signed up, had volunteered like some of you and because many of our families in church had said we'll help with the foster situation we said we would like to help with that but we we can be like alternate caregivers which simply means you're qualified to be a babysitter you could watch somebody's foster children overnight or for the week while they're on vacation we thought that was appropriate way for us to support our foster families here and so we'd signed up for that and so we got news about this little girl named Brooklyn who needed uh, just a place to stay for the weekend. And we said, we can do it for the weekend. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. Well, we thought we were watching her through Sunday, but what was two days turned into be two weeks. And we fell in love with this little girl. And then it became apparent that she was going to need a more permanent home. And so we began to walk through the steps of being foster parents. We had fallen in love with her and said, we, we want her in our home. We, we'll do whatever we need to do. And we began to go through the process and we took the classes and we did the background checks and we got our fingerprints taken and all of those kinds of things. And that October, she was placed in our home as a as a foster child. In fact, I want to show you a picture of me and her in my office, and this is just a day or two after she was officially placed in our home, and that would change our lives right there forever. We began at that point to make room for her in our hearts and to accept her into our home. And so we began to develop a stable uh, environment for her and a family, and all of our grown kids, they were all grown at that point in time, began to fall in love with her and eventually uh, her parents would relinquish rights to her and they began to ask us about adoption and Andrea and I began to pray and began to discuss what that might look like for us. Uh, we would be kind of on the older end of things like that and so we began to, you know, get a little anxious about that. We couldn't see ourselves uh, not having this little girl in our life, and on the other hand, at our age, to have a, a two-year-old at that point in time, uh, we began to do the math, and it didn't look good for graduation, and it didn't look good for future. And uh, then our son Kyler and our daughter-in-law Nikki began to pray and began to process their interest in that, uh, uh, that adoption. And so last uh, spring and during the summer, they began that process of, of, of becoming uh, a part of the DHS system, and uh, they uh, became our alternate caregivers, and they eventually became foster parents that they could be, that she could be placed in their home. And we thought we were looking at about a six-month time frame for them to, uh, to go through before they could be official adoptive parents, but... Uh, we come to find out that November 21st was National Adoption Day, and within about a week's time, uh, they were told that they were going to adopt her. This is just a month ago. That's our son Kyler, our daughter-in-law Nikki, and that's Brooklyn. I haven't shown you too many pictures of her, obviously, because you just can't do that with foster kids, but she's different now because I've gone from being a foster parent to being a grandparent, and I'm, I'm good with that. It's a great gift. It's a great gift that I've experienced. But it pales in comparison to the best gift ever. I love that verse that we read just last week from Galatians 4 that says, When the right time came, God sent his son so that he could adopt us as his very own children. That's the best gift. And that is the invitation of Christmas. It's to make room in your heart and to accept the gift of eternal life that Jesus Christ gives. This Christmas, 
He offers to you the best gift that you could ever receive. Pray with me. Father, we are so grateful for the gift that you have given. We are grateful for the time and the thought that went into that gift. We are thankful, God, for what it means to us personally. We're thankful, God, for the relational aspect of that gift. We're thankful, God, for the sacrifice that you made sending your son to come and to bring us eternal life. And so, Father, may we accept your gift with complete and utter joy. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.